when we look at this K space, this place where we record the MR data. So we've said that this is the time domain and that the vertical dimension in k-space is the number of application of the phase encoding gradient. Now it turns out that this is not just a random manner in which we fill this essentially spreadsheet with the data. So if we look at what's going on in our imaging, we have our RF which excites the spins, we turn on the phase encoding gradient, and then at TE, we sample the signal multiple times. So those signals get sampled from left to right. Now it turns out that in general, when we sample the signal, at least for imaging, we are sampling what we call an echo. So just to briefly go back, we talked about how if this is the T2 star curve, this is where we gave our 90 degree RF pulse, at some point we gave a 180, and at this point there is a regrowth of the signal to where it hits the T2 curve, and that's a peak from which it will then again decline with T2 star. So we want TE to occur at the peak of that spin echo. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, by the way, but you might as well take advantage of all the signal, the maximal refocusing that you get. However, we don't image, we don't sample our signal within an instant in time. It's just not possible. It takes time to sample the signal. So the way the sampling is set up is such that it straddles that peak of the echo. So during the period of time that we are sampling, there is actually a progressive increase and then a progressive decrease in the signal. And that's true when we sample a spin echo for reasons that we'll talk about tomorrow morning. Uh, it's also true when we don't have a spin echo. That's the gradient echo that I think we were talking about before. So what that means is that when we look at the signal within one of these rows, Right? Those signals must be written in, in the order in which they were acquired. If not, the Fourier transform is not going to correctly understand the data and not return an accurate result. So as a result, we have a lower signal amplitude on the left, with signal peaking in the center and then trailing off toward the right. So looking at, and this will be true of every single row in k-space. When we look from left to right, the maximum amplitude is always going to be down the middle. Now, we've said that we have to then go out to TR and iterate this again and again and again, each time changing the magnitude of the phase encoding gradient. So when we write that data into k-space, it is done in a very specific and deliberate way, such that the center lines, center rows of k-space, are the ones acquired with the lowest amplitude of the phase encoding gradient. Lowest amplitude means that if we look at two adjacent populations of spins, they see the smallest difference in net field strength and undergo the least amount of dephasing. Therefore, they preserve the most coherent transverse magnetization, right? and the signal amplitude is going to be highest. And then, k-space is filled in sequential order with progressively higher and higher slopes of the phase encoding gradient until we get to the periphery. So what that means is that if we look at the signal amplitude going from top to bottom in k-space, it is a maximal amplitude right, in the center trailing off toward the top and the bottom. Okay? And there is a top and a bottom 
because in addition to these applications of the gradient magnetic field, we also apply them right, with the opposite polarity. So in addition to this range of signal amplitudes, there is this symmetry to k-space. Right? That it is symmetric both top to bottom and right to left. Now it actually turns out that it has a unique kind of symmetry called conjugate symmetry such that there is a, a diagonal identity right, from point to point as you go from right, one corner to the other. So if we understand the value of this point in k-space, it actually turns out that you can directly reproduce its corresponding sort of caddy corner location. In fact, and we'll talk about this later on, if you would only collect enough information to fill the top half of k-space, only the first half of these lines, based on this conjugate symmetry, we could make up the rest and generate an image. And you would have a lot of trouble telling the difference. Okay? Or, if on the other hand we only collected the front end, right, the first half, we only sampled the first number of signals, we could do the same thing to make up the right side. Now, these would have sort of different applications. As I've said before, collecting only the first half of each row doesn't really buy us anything in terms of time. But if, on the other hand, we only have to collect the first 50 rows instead of all 100, that's done what to your imaging time? It's in half, right? But how could you, how could you only sample the first half of the rows from left to right if those are, if those are spaces. They're not. This is the time domain. Oh. We didn't get that. This is K space, okay? This is in the time domain, okay? Right? So, and this interpolation that I'm talking about where we fill up the rest of it occurs in the time domain before you do the Fourier transform. Once you do the Fourier trans, you can't no, you can't do that. You can't sort of only Fourier transform to make up, you know, half of the image and then figure out the rest of it. This symmetry, this property is unique to the time domain data. Right. Okay. Last thing before we stop, and we'll look at some real life examples of this after lunch, is that given that the highest amplitude is in the center of K-space, by contrast, the characteristics of the periphery of k-space are that these are the areas where there is the greatest, not signal amplitude, but gradient amplitude. Okay? Our steepest phase encoding gradients are at the top and the bottom. Similarly, even for our frequency encoding gradient, those are also on the extremes. So, Given that these are the highest gradient amplitudes, remember that the, fre the frequency of precession is proportional to the net magnetic field strength. So this periphery of k-space is subject to the highest net magnetic field strength and as a result has the highest precessional frequency. Right? So there is a tremendous amount of low signal amplitude, but very high frequency information. And each of these regions contribute different aspects to the image. And suffice it to say at this point that signal amplitude is essential for the delineation of contrast in the image. So the fact that the tumor looks different is detectable relative to the normal tissue because they have different amounts of signal amplitude. Whereas the periphery of k-space, these high frequencies are essential for 
spatial resolution in the image. Or more specifically, not really spatial resolution, but the ability for us to define borders and edges in the image. So not that we can detect the signal amplitude between the tumor and the surrounding normal tissue, but that we can say, ah, this is exactly where one ends and the other begins. That requires this high frequency information. And depending on, right, having more or less information in these different components of K-space <coughs> will have significant implications for the ability of the image to demonstrate contrast and, and spatial resolution or edge definition. <coughs> Which one is the time free? Phase or frequency? <laughs> Which one is time free? Yeah, it doesn't take extra time. So the penalty in terms of imaging time is phase encoding. Phase. Right, because we need to acquire multiple okay. lines, and each one of those lines right, requires a new iteration of the signal excitation and acquisition. So for every additional bit of resolution you want in that phase encoding direction, you need to run through another time. Okay? Does everyone understand why adding resolution in the frequency encoding direction does not cost you time? No? Because frequency is free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone? Why doesn't it matter? If I want to add additional resolution in the frequency encoding direction, what determines how many pixels I'm going to have in my frequency encoding direction? Anybody? Right. How many times we sample the signal at TE. And remember that Right, we excite the signal with our slice select gradient, turn on our frequency, our phase encoding gradient, and then we sample the signal at TE with our frequency encoding gradient. Then we wait until TR, right? And that's when we go back to the beginning and repeat this again with a change in the strength of the phase encoding gradient. So we can acquire many, many, many samples around TE just using up this time that we would be waiting around before we repeat the whole thing anyway. So making this sampling time a little bit longer doesn't have anything to do with the total time that it takes us to complete the process. Right. I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, what you drew the um, this graph of the signal amplitude with a peak at the middle of TE. Yes. But I thought when you drew the free induction decay right. that it was greater at the beginning and then trailed up. So it's true that a free induction decay right, looks like that. A free induction decay means that we turn on our RF, tip the spins into the transverse plane, generate transverse magnetization, and then as time goes on, there is relaxation of that transverse magnetization. So this is when we give our 90 degree RF pulse. And down here might be when we sample at TE. Okay. That's if we're sampling a free induction decay. But what happens is, if instead, if we turn on a 180 degree RF pulse at this point in time, what happens to the signal? Well, all of a sudden, it starts to increase in amplitude until we get to TE. So this scenario, the spin echo, is the scenario that I was showing you. Mm 
if we would be sampling a free induction decay, you're right. The signal would be highest on the left in K space and get progressively lower as we went to the right. Okay? Yes, Larry. Do we image free induction decay, like, clinically? No. Okay. No. Uh, because even when we're not using a spin echo, we're still never really looking at a free induction decay. We're always looking at some type of an echo. Uh, and if it's not a spin echo, it would be something called a gradient echo, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But suffice it to say, it entails an increase and then a decrease in signal amplitude. Okay? All right. So, but before we maybe go back over a couple of these things again, when we talked about K space, right, we pointed out that the signal amplitude is going to be the highest in the center. And the reason for that is that left to right, we're sampling an echo that peaks in the middle of this time period. Right, this is time left to right. And that top to bottom, we have a series of signals each acquired under a different amplitude of the phase encoding gradient. All right. And that we array that signal in k-space such that the lowest amplitude phase encoding gradient acquired signals are in the center. And that as we get further out to the periphery, we have higher and higher amplitude of the phase encoding gradient. All right and that it's this highest signal amplitude information that contributes most to the contrast in our image, but that the periphery of K-space, which has very low signal amplitude, and I'll show you in a minute how low amplitude it is, has a very rich and important amount of information in it, which is encoded by the high frequency information which has a lot to do with spatial resolution or edge definition, rather, in the images. Okay? So if we just take a look at that for a minute. Uh, okay. So. Right, so this is an image of the K-space data. This is an image, well it's not an image really, where this direction is the frequency encoding direction, and this direction is the phase encoding direction. So what's happened is we sampled each row separately and the grayscale of this image is just telling you the signal amplitude. So there are multiple points in time and the dimensions here are 512 by 256. So this is an array of 512 across by 256 up and down and each of the values is plugged in here, right? First, for the first phase encoding step, the second, third, fourth, and so on. They're laid out here so that the lowest gradient amplitudes, the ones that do the least destruction of the signal, remember when we turn on that phase encoding gradient, adjacent spins process at different frequencies that dephasing leads to less net, net transverse magnetization, less signal, okay? So as we <clears throat> are under the influence of these lower magnitude phase encoding gradients, there is a greater amount of signal and less and less as we get out to the periphery. Similarly, since this is a spin echo acquisition and we're sampling the signal, I said this is, this is actually not accurate. This is not the frequency di direction. This is time. 
right? So we're sampling this signal over time. This is a spin echo, so we're on the early part of that signal ramping up toward the echo on the left and then ramping down on the right. So you can see, for example, in the middle row, there is relatively low signal and it gets progressively higher and there's quite a lot of signal amplitude in the center. For these rows up at the top and the bottom, it kind of looks very low signal all along. If you look carefully, it is higher signal in the center. But the point is that the phase encoding gradient magnetic field that has been applied for these upper and lower rows is of such a strength that it's really dramatically dephasing and destroying the signal that we sample when we turn those gradient magnetic fields on. Okay, this is just taking the exact same thing and plotting it a different way. Right? So this is the same XY dimensions and here I'm just showing you the signal amplitude instead of showing it just as a grayscale you can see that there's a tremendous amount of signal amplitude in the center and there's very, very little signal amplitude in most of the periphery. But as we'll see in a minute, all of this very low amplitude stuff out here actually has a lot of very important information. You would think that it kind of looks like there's nothing much going on there. How could that really contribute anything to the image? And this is the result of what you get when you Fourier transform each row across first, and then in a second step, each column down. So what I'm going to do, just to give you a sense of what the nature of the signal in case space is, is take this same image, and we're going to generate the same image multiple times, but only using various fractions of the amount of information in case space. So in this first example, right, the circle over here is showing you that I've excluded a small amount of the periphery of case space. And you can see that there's a dramatic change in the image quality. There's still contrast, right? So we can still see that there are differences in signal amplitude here, but the edges have all become right, dramatically blurred. If you look at like the foley and the cerebellum, you can get a sense that there is a contrast there, but in the in this not cerebellum, so you couldn't even tell, right? Okay, but if you look at this contrast between basal ganglia, right, insula, temporal cortex, white matter, that you can see that those edges are very sharply defined when we use all of the data. And here, we lose all of that spatial resolution. Now the actual resolution of this image in terms of the number of pixels in each direction is the same. I'm just using less of the case-based data to reconstruct it. Right? And this is using even less. And this is using even less. So there's some contrast there, right? We can tell that there are, there's different types of stuff in this image, but you can't tell anything about where it is because the ability to define those edges is lost because we have none of that high frequency information. Right? So here is the image we're starting out with again. And if we, this time instead, I'm going to throw away the center of K-space just the very center, the highest amplitude information. So you can see that the image has relatively poor contrast, but those edges are really extremely sharp. And if we progressively expand the amount that we include, that's actually the same thing, I'm sorry, if we expand the amount that we exclude from the center of K-space, you can see that there are still, there's still edge definition, but the image, first of all, the signal to noise of the image goes way down. And secondly, the ability to tell that there are different tissues there, other than dramatic differences like CSF and tissue, 
is, is really lost. And in this case, right, the signal to noise is terrible because we've excluded almost all of the data, but you can still see hints of edge definition left in the image because even these very low amplitude peripheral components of case space still contribute right, important information to the image. Okay. So, now this is actually going to become important, right? So it seems like, right, knowing how you spatially encode the image, understanding the distribution of stuff in case space, like, who cares? I mean, unless you just want to know how this works. Uh, but there actually are real applications and real reasons why you might want to understand right, how the image is constructed and how the data is encoded. And some of the reasons for that are the ability to accelerate the speed of imaging. So if you're going to understand fast imaging, some of the right, most important approaches in fast imaging have to do with manipulating the way that we fill up K-space the order in which the information is placed in there, or as I alluded to before, even exploiting the conjugate symmetry in case space. So we could cut our imaging time in half by acquiring just the first 50% and essentially just making up the rest of it. Or just to give you one more example, let's say that we're interested in imaging <coughs> at a very high rate. Let's say you want to do some kind of real-time angiography. You want to look at right, the first pass of a contrast bolus. So we know that, and we need to have an image that has reasonable spatial resolution so we can make some, you know, some diagnostic quality images. So we know that to acquire you know, however many, let's say 256 different lines in case space is going to take a substantial amount of time. Time is determined by what? TR. The TR and the number of phase encoding steps, right? Each of these rows is what we mean by phase encoding steps. So each additional row that you acquire is going to cost you time. And on the other hand, right, if we want to, let's say, image in real time as a bolus passes through the patient, right, maybe we're interested in acquiring an image, I don't know, every second, every 500 milliseconds, every 50 milliseconds. I mean, angiography, you know, cut film or digital catheter angiography, you're imaging at a, at a temporal resolution of what? Anyone have an idea? Hmm? Probably around 20 milliseconds, right? So MR isn't quite there, but there are ways to maybe image at an interval of, let's say, 50 milliseconds, right? Well, if the fact of the matter is that to acquire this many lines of k-space takes, you know, 250 milliseconds, and for you to capture the clinical information you need to see this bolus transit through the tissue, you need a temporal resolution of at least 50 milliseconds. So how could you possibly do that? Well, one approach, and this is something that's used in, right, in pretty routine clinical practice, is you can image the patient, right? So we have our person in the scanner. We're going to inject, right, some contrast agent, let's say, and we want to image their head. Maybe they have an AVM in the brain, and we want to image that brain 
multiple times over a brief period at a resolution of 50 milli temporal resolution of 50 milliseconds. So we can't image the whole brain multiple times and even get close to this. But what we can do is acquire an image of this full resolution of the entire brain before we ever give the contrast. And just set that aside. So we have image number one, which is going to be a non-contrast image. Then we could set up our scan so that it's designed to only acquire the central right, fifth of K space. Right. Only those lines. And we can image while we inject the contrast and acquire multiple images where each time we image, the only lines that we are filling up are that central one fifth of K space. Now if all I have is those central few lines, as we just saw before, I, I can't generate a useful image. But what we can do now is take the peripheral part of K-space from this image that we acquired before ever giving the contrast injection and simply use that information to fill in what we didn't acquire during the dynamic part of the scan. Okay? And we can go through and we can turn each one of these through a 2D Fourier transform into separate images, one without contrast, and a series of images each acquired at an interval of 50 milliseconds that shows us the real-time transit of the contrast. Now the reason why you can do that, you might say, well, wait a second. This image, we're taking information from a pre-contrast image and we're combining it with a post-contrast. Doesn't it like mess things up? So the information that is important from the dynamic part of this study is that we inject the contrast agent into the vein and it's flowing through the arteries and veins in the brain. And we're interested in detecting the contrast, right, contrast not referring to contrast agent, but the physical image contrast between the blood in the vessels and everything else outside the vessels. That is something that is dependent on contrast resolution, which is a function of what's going on with the highest amplitude signals in the center of K-space. The edge definition or spatial information in K-space is actually present, right, whether we have the contrast agent in the patient or not. So what we're doing here is taking the most relevant part of K-space, paring things down so we only acquire that during this dynamic phase of the study. And it allows us to take the most relevant part of K-space, apply it during this period of time, and when we combine this back together, we actually can get a very, I'll show you a case of this on Thursday, we can get a very high quality study because the spatial information really doesn't matter when you acquire that. Right? By understanding the nature of what you place in the periphery of K-space and what you place in the center of K-space, you can manipulate it in this way to do something that otherwise, if you were going to acquire the entire image at once, would be impossible to achieve that kind of resolution. This approach, by the way, is called keyhole imaging because you essentially just cut out that center piece of K-space and acquire it separately. Okay. And there are a bunch of other tricks and ways in which the acquisition and ordering of the data in K-space can be used to both accelerate imaging as well as control contrast in the images. And that's something we'll talk about more tomorrow afternoon when we talk about uh, fast, fast imaging.